So to start off, our first speaker is uh, Guillaume Mogé, who will be speaking on aerosols, clouds, and climate. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Guillaume. He's in his sixth year at Scripps, and he is he's studying uh, aerosol cloud interactions with Joel Norris. He's a graduate of Harvey Mudd College, just up the road. He is fluent in French, and he intends to spend a part of his career pursuing research in France. Guillaume is supported by ARCS, that's the Achievement Rewards for College Scientists, the San Diego chapter. Uh, welcome, Guillaume Mogé. So uh, first of all, Tony mentioned that uh, um, all Scripps students should be uh, taking about five years here. And then Dan went on to say that I'm in my sixth, that I just haven't been able to convince myself to leave yet. So, um, so I'm going to be talking about aerosols, clouds, and climate. And uh, before I get started, I wanted to mention that my advisor is uh, Joel Norris. That's who I've been working with while I'm here. Um, so I want to start off with this title slide I've got here, which is um, an image of the east coast of the United States. And uh, so you can see this is New York City right here. And you can see um, somewhere around here, Providence, Rhode Island. And you see this in this cloud deck over the Atlantic, there's all these lines in it where the clouds are brighter. So um, this is an early observation. This is just one example of what it looked like when people first saw it. It's a satellite image. And you'll notice that a lot of these lines are actually coming right out of the big ports. Um, Providence, there's a bay there, and then right into New York. And so those are actually following the tracks that merchant vessels or ships um, have followed through the ocean, and, and it's the emissions of those ships that are actually influencing the cloud properties there. So it's an early in observation of the direct influence of humans on clouds, and then consequently the climate. So this is sort of like an early motivation for um, my research, and um, so I want to talk a little bit about what's going on here. So first of all, in the title it says aerosol, so I want to define what that is in case you're not familiar with it is. So Aerosols, it's not just aerosol spray cans. That's just one example. An aerosol is actually any particle that's suspended in the air. And they range in sizes. They're usually at least 100 times smaller than the average human hair. And the concentrations are pretty large. In a centimeter cube, which is about the volume of the tip of your index finger, there tend to be between 10 and 100,000 particles in the air, pretty much everywhere. And um, so there's are pictures taken from Scripps right down the hill here. And you can see the difference between sort of a, a clean day when there aren't that many aerosols in the air, and you can see the horizon clearly, and a polluted day on the right when you, you can't even tell exactly where the horizon is. So it, it makes a big difference. And these also influence the clouds. So in the last picture, you see we're, we're seeing that there's this influence on the clouds from the aerosols. So how is that happening? What exactly is causing the aerosols to change the cloud properties? So, well, there's sort of a conceptual reason for that. Cloud droplets cannot form unless they have a seed to form on, and aerosols act as that seed. So there's a particle at the center of every cloud droplet. And if you have more particles, more aerosols, then you have more cloud droplets. So what happens then is you have a polluted cloud. It has the same amount of water as the non-polluted clouds next to the ship track. So they have more droplets. But if they have more droplets, then the water is spread out over more droplets, that each droplet has to be smaller. And smaller droplets have more surface area, and they actually more, reflect more. So that's why, in that picture, they're brighter where the ships have passed by. We see brighter clouds along the ship tracks, like that one there. And that's because there's more particles, and they're, they're reflecting more sunlight. OK, so more aerosols, more polluted areas creates more reflective clouds. Why do we care about that? Well. They're more reflective, they're brighter. That means they're reflecting sunlight away from the Earth. So there's less energy getting to the surface, and it's, it's cooler. So it's a cooling influence on the climate. So, so to, to get into a little bit more clearly about why that's so important, I'm going to backtrack a little bit. I want to talk about the specific types of clouds I'm looking at in my thesis, which are stratocumulus clouds. And they're familiar to us in San Diego. It's a convenient place to um, study them, because whenever they're talking about the marine layer in the weather report, they're talking about stratocumulus clouds. Those are the clouds that are very common offshore here. And you see them, it's, if you take off from a, from a plane out of the airport here, you come up through them and there's this really wide, flat deck. Those are the clouds we're talking about and, and it actually extends really far. So that's what I wanted to show here. Here we are in La Jolla. 
And this is sort of the typical June gloom picture. So, and, and, and what I want to show is it extends really far. It actually extends even farther in this particular image. This is a couple hundred miles offshore, but it keeps going. So there's a couple of features of these clouds. And, and, and one is that, is that they're widespread. And they're very flat. They're low level. An important consequence of that, and we know that from June gloom here, is that they reflect a lot of sunlight. We don't get nearly as much sun at the surface. It's a lot cooler on those days than on days when we don't have the clouds. So that, again, it's a cooling influence on the climate. They're really bright clouds. They're reflecting lots of sunlight. And it's not warming as much here. So what's so, I'll, so let me show a little bit more of a technical um, image of what's going on with that. And um, the colors are showing up a little bit weird on, on this plot. But um, basically, what this is showing is the net amount of energy absorbed by the Earth system at any particular longitude and latitude. And so you have sort of shades of orange over, say, the Sahara there, which are warming. And then you have these shades of blue, which are cooling, where you have, for some reason, the Earth is, system is not absorbing as much energy in other areas. And all of these blue regions, off of Peru, Namibia, off of Europe, and off of San Diego, those are the stratocumulus regions of the world. So stratocumulus clouds have a major cooling influence on the climate. So the reason I'm studying the influence of aerosols on these is because if they already have a cooling effect, any small changes to them is likely to be really important to the climate. So, so I got to go study these um, in situ in a field campaign. And I want to mention before the start, you see we are holding beers there. This was after the experiment was over. We were celebrating. <laughs> so, so, so it was fun. That was in, actually not here. It was in Northern California. And we got to fly through some of these clouds and measure the air, um, comparing the amount of aerosol to the properties of the clouds. And what we found was that it is true. The aerosols do seem to be influencing the cloud properties. But it's not clear that that is important enough to outweigh the already large meteorological influence on clouds. Clouds, of course, are not only sensitive to aerosol or pollution. They're also sensitive to what the weather is doing. So that brings us to sort of a, the overarching theme of my research here, which is based on what we've been talking about so far, which is this observation that aerosols influence clouds um, and, that, and, that, and could have an impact on climate. The question is, how big is that impact when we look at the entire globe? Is it a, is it a big climate influence, or, or is it negligible? Does it not matter? And it's an important question because aerosols are bad for our health. So they're not just affecting the climate. They're also health-wise have impacts. And so we have to get rid of them. There's, it's not my field, of course, but there are regulations working on reducing that. And if they reduce that, will we find out that we actually had a masked um, greenhouse effect because of the cooling effect of these aerosols? And then we'll see an accelerated warming after that? Or is the effect small enough that removing them won't affect the climate at all, and they haven't been affecting the climate so far? So, so, so since then, my research, since the uh, in situ observations I showed with the plane there, my research is focused on satellite observations, large scale observations. Um, and uh, so this is sort of an example just of, of what uh, one of the findings. And, and so what I've got plotted here is the amount of aerosols. Uh, measured by satellite. And so it, more polluted is on the right and cleaner is on the left. And the amount of cloud on the y-axis. And so more clouds up here and less clouds down here. So there's a lot of, there's a, it's a blob, right? So there's a lot of factors at play. It's aerosol is, like I said, is not the only thing. But there is this general trend between more polluted areas tend to be more cloudy than less polluted areas tend to be less cloudy. And so it's tempting to conclude from this that there is a clear um, climate influence of aerosols. They're impacting the clouds. And so we could calculate how much that climate impact is and talk about how important that is. But that would be the, the wrong conclusion to draw. And the reason is that correlation does not imply causation. And this is something you hear a lot in statistics. And I want, there's an example that sort of helps to, under, to understand what I'm talking about here, which is that a simp you could take a different observation, that big fires tend to have a lot of firemen um, fighting it. And you could conclude that from that, well, another fact, big fires tend to also cause a lot of damage. So big fires, lots of damage, more firemen, firemen cause fire damage. So that would be, that would be incorrectly assuming that correlation implies causation, when in fact it does not, right? There are more firemen because of a third factor, which is that um, big fires uh, now let me think. 
this through this clearly. Uh, so the, th the third factor is that big fires involve more firemen, and big fires also cause a lot of damage, right? So the third factor is the fact that is the big fires, right? It's not the damage is correlated to the directly to the firemen. There's a third factor. So I could have stated that more clearly, but what I'm trying to say, <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I'm trying to say is that aerosols are not the only influence on clouds. So, so they're, like I said earlier, weather is another important factor that influences clouds. And so in order to disentangle what's going on and how important the climate impact of aerosols are, we have to separate the influence of weather on clouds from the influence of aerosols on clouds. And so that's what my research is focused on. So, so I'm going to go ahead and summarize. And... Uh, <laughs> So, so basically, what I've been saying is that I showed you some, some evidence to believe that aerosols might have a large climate effect uh, on clouds, but we don't know exactly if it's, if it's important or if it's negligible. And, and in order to, to find out exactly how important it is, we, got, we have to separate the influence of other factors, like the meteorology, from the, the influence of aerosols. So that's the focus of my thesis, and that's what I've been working on here. So with that, um, I, don't, I wanted to acknowledge first also the ARCS Foundation, which has allowed me to have a lot of freedom in doing my research and been really helpful. And uh, thanks for listening, and I'd be glad to try to answer any of your questions. The question was, are there any indications so far as to what the answer is? And, and yeah, and, and that's actually a little bit of what I just skipped over. But, um, uh, <laughs> but, but the, the answer is, it's probably a little bit of both. The, the, to some extent, the meteorology is, is causing sort of a false correlation between the aerosols and the, and the clouds. But there does seem, there, it's not clear that there's no association between the two. So it's, what I've found so far is that it's in between the two. Um, yeah, and I could talk to you more in detail afterwards about that, but basically, I mean, it, it, it's, it's just a question of being careful. It's making sure that you know what your assumptions are. Um, so when we're looking at that plot, for example, the scatter plot, um, thinking carefully about can we actually conclude, do the, high, do the polluted cases really compare to the clean cases, the unpolluted cases, in terms of the meteorology, or is it different meteorology? So basically, it's just that. It's, it's being a little bit more, digging a little bit deeper into the observations. <laughs> you could conclude that except for the health issue. Since it's bad for, for health, it wouldn't do us any good to be, to be getting lung cancer instead of having... Everyone gets a, yeah, it's a gas mask. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the, the question was, so uh, if I was suggesting that we should increase pollution in order to solve the global warming problem. And, and the answer, of course, is that health is the other factor that makes it impossible to do that. Thank you very much, Gil. Thanks. Our next speaker is uh, Jessica Carilli. She'll be talking about coral forensics, using clues from coral rings to inform management decisions. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Jessica. She's a fifth year student, so Tony's okay with her right now. Um, <laughs> studying the history of coral reef degradation in the Caribbean. Her field work in the Caribbean has presented a number of interesting logistics challenges, including a bout of dengue fever during her last drilling trip. I hope it's not contagious. Uh, her advisor is Richard Norris. She did her undergraduate work at UCSD, participating in the brand new at the time environmental systems program, which is still going strong. Jessica has been supported by private gifts and by the Edna Bailey Sussman Fund. Jessica. Okay, Sparking, thank you very much for the opportunity to explain my research to you. So coral reefs have often been called the rainforests of the sea because they're very high in biodiversity and they occur in tropical waters and they're very beautiful. Coral reefs are built by coral animals. These are colonial organisms, and they are kind of like miniature anemones, but they produce a skeleton. So this is a picture of one of the corals that I work on, 
and the individual polyps have their tentacles closed here. Um, but at night, most corals open their polyps, like here, to feed on plankton. But they get most of their food from the photosynthesis of symbiotic algae that live in the coral tissue. And that's why they're so colorful. Coral reefs are similar to forests in another way, which is the 3D complexity that they create. This uh, three-dimensional complexity gives uh, habitat for many other organisms. Unfortunately, worldwide, corals are dying, um, and the loss is particularly severe in the Caribbean. In the past 30 years, just during the time period that people have been really paying attention, the Caribbean has lost about 80% of its live coral cover. And there are many, many reasons why corals are dying. Um, one of them is physical damage from tourists walking on the reef or from anchor damage. Another is coral bleaching. Uh, this occurs when warm water temperatures cause the symbiosis between the algae and the coral to break down. And the algae gets expelled from the coral and if the water temperatures remain high for too long, the coral will basically starve to death. Another problem is overgrowth of coral reefs by algae. And this can happen um, for a number of factors, one of which would be overfishing plant-eating fish, which can then no longer control the growth of algae. Another reason would be addition of too many nutrients from fertilizer runoff or sewage pollution. Coral diseases have also become much more prevalent um, in the past couple of decades, becoming much more widespread. This is a picture of a brain coral with black band disease in the Caribbean. Another factor is sedimentation. Um, this is a picture of some runoff from agricultural land in Hawaii. And sediment can smother corals and it can block the sunlight from the algal photosynthesis. And sediment particles can also have attached heavy metals and other pollutants which are toxic to the corals. So with all these different threats going on, it's very important to know which ones to focus on to conserve specific reefs. It's not possible for most um, conservation organizations to tackle all of these problems at once. So what my research is focusing on is looking at specific reefs and determining whether sedimentation and other forms of runoff are affecting the reefs there and whether that is something that needs to be tackled. Corals are similar to trees in another way, which is very convenient. Um, they have annual bands. So this is an image on the left here of a coral x-ray, a slab of coral skeleton which we've x-rayed. And these bright bands here are um, very dense bands that form in the summertime. So we can measure the thickness of these bands, how much the coral grew each year in the past, counting from the time that it was collected, when we knew it, it was alive, to see how healthy the coral was in the past. And we can construct a very long baseline of coral health, much farther back into the past than any of the recent studies, which I said have only gone back about 30 years for most locations. Coral colonies can live for hundreds of years, so that means if we can um, collect a large enough sample, we can go much farther back in time. Um, another wonderful thing about corals is that because they're constructing their skeleton out of the seawater, they record a history of what the water quality was like. So we can look at the growth rates in the past, how healthy the coral was, and what the water quality was like, and see if they're correlated. This is my um, study location. I'm looking at the Mesoamerican Reef, which is in the Western Caribbean. It's the second largest barrier reef in the world. It's the largest reef in the Northern Hemisphere. And these sites in the pink are all the locations where, that I'm personally studying. In the south here, you can see these are large mountains. And large mountains mean a lot of rain. When you couple that with a lot of agriculture here in the south, that means a lot of runoff is going to be coming out onto these reefs. Um, in the north here, this site is pretty far from the source of runoff. Um, so that's kind of our comparison site to see if these sites in the south are more affected by runoff than that northern site, while also looking at time series at each of these sites. So today, I'm just going to be talking about the Sapodilla Key site and the Turnaf Atoll site. 
And a lot of my funding has um, gone towards the logistics of collecting cores from all of these sites. And um, like Dan said, it's not been very easy, getting uh, mosquito-borne illness on my last trip. But um, I just wanted to also share a little uh, story of how I get all of my gear around. Uh, I can't fly in an airplane with this 250-pound compressor. So I've had to first uh, ship it to Belize City and then uh, take a school bus down to the south of Belize um, before going out to the Sapodilla Keys. And then in order to get over to Honduras, we had to take a, a boat over to Guatemala and get on a, a little mini bus over to the border where I was stopped for a really long time and questioned in Spanish. And unfortunately, I'm not very good with Spanish. Um, and then we had to go on, and I'm saying we, but I just mean me. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> me and my equipment. So I had to go on a bunch of buses and taxis and more buses and boats. And um, all of that took several days and, and wasn't too fun. But eventually I got to my, my sites and I was able to collect my uh, coral samples. So what I do is I just collect a core. We don't have to collect an entire coral head so it doesn't really injure the coral very much. And I have this large compressor up here that sits in the boat and it powers an air drill. And I usually just swim down and take off my fins and put my toes into some cracks in the dead part of the reef and hang on and drill away. Um, and eventually come up with cores that look like this. Um, but sometimes sorry, the uh, surge is very bad or there's a lot of live coral I don't want to step on, so I end up drilling upside down like this. So this is an image of some of the cores. This is the top living portion here um, when they were collected, and these are x-rays, again, of the, the coral skeleton. So what this is showing is in the bottom panel here, I don't know if you can really see that, but there's this dense band. So I said that the dense part of the skeleton forms in the summer, but this is an exceptionally dense band, and we see it throughout all of the cores from all of the sites. On the top here, this, uh, these red circles are showing areas where the coral actually died. Part of the colony died at the same time as we have this very dense band. So what this indicates is that something very different was happening than in the past. We don't see anything similar to this throughout the 150 or so record that we have. Um, and it happens in every single course. So the reason this occurred is because in 1998, there was a very strong El Nino, which had very warm water temperatures and worldwide bleaching. And at the same time, these corals were particularly unlucky because Hurricane Mitch came through and stalled over Honduras, releasing a huge amount of rain, causing massive flooding, and this is uh, two satellite images. The bright red colors indicate more sediment in the water. So during a normal time period, we have a lot of sediment really constrained close to the coast. But right after Hurricane Mitch, the black is clouds that are in the way. But uh, we can see these plumes of sediment that extended throughout the reef and affected all of these sites, which is very unusual. So looking at the long-term record, these are the growth rates so of multiple corals that have been averaged together over time. This is uh, time here, starting from 1900, at the site in the south, the Sapodilla Keys. So what this shows is that there was obviously a very big influence on growth rates during the 1998 event that I showed, but there was also a slight decline in growth rates over the second half of the 20th century. At the same time, we measured sedimentation in the coral skeletons. So we do this by measuring barium. It's an element that's very concentrated in continental rocks, and it substitutes for calcium in the coral skeleton. So this gives us a record of how much sediment was in the water. And we could see that there was an increase in the amount of sediment in the second half of the 20th century, at the same time that we see decreasing growth rates. At the northern site, I've overlaid those um, records on top here. We don't really see the same pattern. We see that the growth rates have continued to chug along steadily, uh, except for this event here, and that sedimentation was also a lot lower than in the south and didn't really increase. So what this indicates is that at these two different sites, there's very different conservation goals. In the south, Sapodilla Keys is obviously impacted by sediment. Right now it's a marine reserve, and so they're controlling fishing. However, that's really not going to do anything to stop sediment from coming into the reserve. So they need to work with farmers in Guatemala and Honduras to plant 
uh, vegetative boundaries along rivers, may need to replant mangroves, things like that, which will stop sediment from coming out to the reef. And in the north at Terneff Atoll, even though growth rates have not been declining, the reef is quite dead in many places. So there's obviously something else going on there, potentially bleaching or disease or hurricane impacts that will need some other form of address. Um, so the next slides for Sorry, the next steps for my research are to analyze the cores from Honduras and to measure other indicators such as uh, past water temperature and nutrients. So thank you very much for all my donors. Um, that's a good question. Am I looking at all at the effect of declining pH in the ocean? And I am not specifically looking at that because I think that is a pretty small effect compared to these much larger scale physical impacts and runoff. But it is something that a lot of people are worried about. Have I related the health of the coral to decline in fish spawning? Um, I haven't actually. I don't really have those data yet, but I do plan to look at um, the amount of fish and the coral cover in recent years and compare that to my growth rates to see how the growth rate data actually compares to current ecological information. Good question. With the various diseases of the coral, am I taking any measures to prevent spreading it? Um, I try not to touch the diseased corals. Um, and some people have shown that you can spread disease between reefs by wearing the same wetsuit that isn't disinfected. So I do try and clean my wetsuit between sites. Um, yeah, but I'm not really sure what else I can do there. Um, good question. So the coral that I'm studying grows less than a centimeter per year. So I would say this is about maybe 20 or 30 years of growth. So why does the coral grow more dense during an adverse environmental conditions? Um, during the summertime, the coral grows more densely because it's basically not extending upwards anymore. It's stressed out by the high water temperatures in the summertime but it's, it's still calcifying, it's still building its skeleton, but it's not growing upward. So that's why it, it becomes more dense. So during a stressful time period, it's going to do the same thing. It's not going to grow upwards, it's just going to keep making its skeleton and getting very, very dense. Why isn't it round? Um, you mean this here? Oh, because it's a core from a round core barrel that I took. It's kind of round this way. <laughs> there's a, there's a, a slab that I took out of the middle to take the x-ray, <laughs> sorry. Excellent. Right. Thank you. All right. We have our final talk. Our final speaker is, uh, is Damien C. And he will be talking about native Hawaiian aquaculture, learning from the past. And uh, let me tell you a, a few things about Damien. Uh, Damien is a native Hawaiian himself, and he presented me a challenge just a few minutes ago, and that is to pronounce his middle name. <laughs> so let's see if I can do it. Here we go. The, his middle name is, is Kahekili, and he was raised in Kainai, Maui. Uh, so he is studying native Hawaiian aquaculture, and he is a native Hawaiian himself. He, uh, he received his BS in biology and an MS in marine ecology from San Diego State University. He will combine anthropology, political science, economics, and marine biology to investigate the environmental and cultural effects of restoring the native Hawaiian fish ponds. He is a second year student and is pursuing both a PhD at Scripps and an MBA at UCSD's Rady School of Management. He is the first uh, in this very new program that combines a PhD from Scripps with, with the masters from Rady School. Uh, Damien's support has come from several sources, including the UCSD diversity program and generous individual private gifts. Uh, welcome, Damien C. Uh, aloha. Uh, I'd first like to thank you. You said it actually properly, so that was a, <laughs> a good translation to the Hawaiian language. And uh, I'd first like to say uh, I am Hawaiian, but I cannot hula, so 
Um, please don't answer. Probably the only Hawaiian who can't. Okay, I want to thank you, uh, all of you again for attending uh, today's Perspective on Ocean Sciences Symposium. And again, my name is uh, Damien Kahikilisi. And uh, without further ado, I'll just kind of jump into my topic. It's on adaptive aquaculture, learning from the past, and in particularly um, Hawaii, or Hawaii. Um, just to start, this picture here is actually an artesian or, or an ancient aquaculture facility um, that's on the Konyoi Bay side or the leeward side of the Oahu Island um, of Hawaii. So in a brief overview, I'm going to basically introduce native Hawaiian aquaculture or Polynesian artesian aquaculture in general, and then summarize the history of it, go over some previous efforts for restoration and scientific study, um, give some preliminary research that I was able to accomplish over my first year as a doctoral student here at Scripps, and then of course go over some project goals that I've kind of decided to uh, focus on and hopefully I can accomplish uh, for my dissertation, and of course end up with uh, why the heck I'm doing this research and give you some significance. For those of you who are familiar, the Hawaiian chain, the seven main Hawaiian islands are right here. This is the Hawaiian state flag, which became state in 1959, and this is the nation of Hawaiian flag. So Hawaiian aquaculture, or um, from now on I'll refer to it as local ias, which is um, Hawaiian fish pond. So local ias um, were one of the most, world's most successful and uh, successful aquaculture achievements in the world. Um, they provide not only uh, local sustenance, but also a spiritual and cultural and political lifestyle for the indigenous people of the islands. What, what, it, mean, what it allowed to do, it has allowed native Hawaiians to not only merely catch fish, but also harvest them and rear them in controlled environments. So what this allowed them to do is basically procure food throughout the year at any time. So local IAs are part of a larger system called the Hawaiian Integrated System shown here on the right. Um, in translation, it's called the Ahapua and which was established, estimated around 1,800 years ago. So you have this aquaculture facility that was developed pretty long ago. Um, it, it, it combines both freshwater and saltwater aquaculture together. Right there, it kind of throws a red flag. You're all freshwater aquaculture, that's not new. You know, what's so special about that? The Egyptians and Chinese have been using that for thousands of years before the Native Hawaiians. However, the Native Hawaiians were the first to use, actually, the, um, use the system in the marine environment, so marine aquaculture, which is what was new at the time. So there are five different types of native Hawaiian fish pond, and again, this picture shows it, and I'll go through it briefly and slowly so I can explain each one. First, you have the mountains up here with the watershed, which runs down to a freshwater fish pond, which is called loko iakalo. Kalo translation means taro, and that was used to farm crops and different types of invertebrates and crustaceans. That led to more of another freshwater pond called loko wai, which was used to, for various types of freshwater fish. That, of course, led down to loko puoene, which is used for brackish water fish, so you had different types of salinity levels. And this led down to the marine environment, which is where I'm focusing on. There's two different types. There's a local umeki, which is a fish trap. Um, that's basically an enclosed body of water that had various uh, channel systems that allowed you to catch fish. And the local kuapa, which is a totally enclosed body of water, which allowed them to actually harvest and raise these fish. So to briefly show you what a local kuapa is, here's a little cartoon, the mountainside of course, the Malka, the river leading down to a local kuapa which is enclosed by a man-made wall. Uh, one thing to note is that it doesn't necessarily have to have the river leading into the local kuapa, sometimes they would end up right here on the side so you have a different salinity environment outside the pond instead of inside. Um, this of course had different sluice gate systems which is one of the major advancements and those range from two to about 15 sluice gates depending on the size of these ponds and they can range from about a one acre up to 60 acres, so they can be very large in some cases. So how do they build these things? They're, they're pretty large, can you up to 60 acres? Well, first of all, of course, they didn't have bulldozers back then, so everything was manpower. And the native Hawaiians were able to collect these basaltic rocks, or large rocks, from various parts of the mountain, mine them off the mountains, and bring them up to 15 kilometers away using a man-made, basically, passing system all the way down to build these walls. And they can be up to 12 meters, or sorry, 12 meters, 12 feet, wide and up to six feet tall. And here's an actual live picture of one shown on Hawaii, and this is on the leeward side of Oahu. Uh, this different color rock on top is mainly there because that's for restoration purposes. They tried to restore the wall, so there's some newer rocks on there, but those weren't the original rocks that were put there. Again, the major advancement in Native Hawaiian aquaculture was the sluice gate system. This is where it becomes really advanced, and I'll try to go through it really slowly so you can ask me questions later. The sluice gate system, this is a front view and an aerial view, allowed them basically to make a channel system in the wall, as you see here. What that allowed is you to have two different 
size grates. So depending on the size of fish you wanted to catch in the pond, you would rate your grading system and put those grates down. So depending on the ebb and flow tide, you would have all of a sudden an influx of flowing water into the pond for fish to take refuge. They would come into the pond, the native Hawaiians would put a, put a little sluice gate down, the fish would accumulate in the channel because they're trying to get to the refuge, they would throw another one down here and it would catch them in the channel. And then they would throw a net and be able to procure the food a lot easier. The same goes the opposite direction. If the fish are in the pond and refuge, all of a sudden you had a high tide and the fish are trying to get out of the pond to feed, same thing, they would put the gate over here, the fish would get caught in the channel, they put another gate and then collect the fish. So it's a really ingenious way and this is where the first advancement in aquaculture, marine aquaculture started. This is a picture of an actual sluice gate. It's a very modern makeup of one. Of course, it was a little more complex than that. But this kind of gives you a general picture of what they look like. So there were about 488 uh, local EAs documented, um, but it's believed that there were about 1,000 that were created over time. Uh, these, of course, degraded, and you're not able to see them anymore. But some new scientific techniques using um, electromagnetic um, techniques were able to find some of these rocks underneath the sediment. So we are finding new ones every day. Uh, they were used to cultivate a variety of species, and I have a next slide shows some of those species going from freshwater to saltwater. You can see as you do that, you increase in species diversity. And, when, and since I'm focusing on the marine environment, the local kuapa and local umeke, you notice that the local kuapa right here has, is like a multi-trophic system. So it's not a monoculture. So you, you can either harvest different types of algae, you can harvest invertebrates, crustaceans, various types of fish, both herbivorous and carnivorous. So what's nice about that is it allowed the system to be self-regulating. So it wasn't like today's standards where a lot of aquaculture is just one particular species and you had this huge detrimental effect on the coastal environment. So these, this system was established and working for about 1,600 years, so quite a long time. However, of course, in the last 200 years, there was a huge decline in the uh, use of these ahapua systems, and then, of course, today, they're not used at all. And this, of course, happened in the mid-1800s when all, you know, Captain Cook, after Captain Cook came and found the Hawaiian Islands, or I say found the Hawaiian Islands, but they were there already, of course, um, and then landed, and what they did is, of course, they brought in a cash economy system, and that changed the whole barter system in Hawaii, and then, of course, destroyed the hierarchy and the different types of royalty classes. Um, so that was the downfall of the Hawaiian society. And then the land ownership issue came up in the Great Mahele of 1848, and that's basically where rich Europeans came over to the Hawaiian Islands and purchased all the land up and pushed all the Hawaiians to certain parts of the land, which then allowed the fish ponds to degrade because they were not being used anymore. This is a really interesting fact. This is actually, this is Oahu, and this is um, Pearl Harbor. I'm sure if you've been there before, there, was actually, there were actually 30 fish ponds located in that area before, and now there's not a single one there because, of, of course, it's a naval base. So past restoration efforts include there was, in the 40s and 50s, state initiatives that were put forth to restore these, or sorry, to protect these historical sites, which made it difficult to restore. So there were pros and cons on that. In the 1960s, there was the Molokai Project, which was very successful to a point. They used both state and private fish ponds and were able to restore about three of them. Uh, the only issue, issue with that is that the ones that were restored are used for the aquarium trade, for more live rock and tropical species of fish rather than for local sustenance. So there's a lot of elders in Hawaii who still don't like the restoration issues. And of course, in the 1970s, we have the whole Hawaiian culture renaissance, which is, you know, non-Hawaiians and Hawaiians alike are all of a sudden out there wanting to learn about the Polynesian culture. I'm sure all of you have driven down the road and you've seen surfboards with Hawaiian covers and Hawaiian car seats and <laughs> everything out there. So the culture is there and people want to learn about it, which hopefully will lead into more funding for this type of project. So for my preliminary research, for the last year, my first year, I was able to look at sites, look at accessibility, size, sedimentation issues, walls, or in Hawaiian, the call kuapa, if they're a state or federally or privately owned, and then, of course, the community surrounding them. These pictures I show on the right, the top one is a 1948 picture of the Ko'iyahe fish pond, which is on Kihei, Maui. And as you can see, there's a little river coming here that's still coming from the mountains, and it's leading into the fish pond, and you still have a concave shoreline, so you still have this sort of a remnants of a fish pond. If you move down to the bottom, this is a picture I took last year. Because of all this urbanization, we have this huge influx of people on that part of the Maui, which is the, the highest populated part of Maui there is in Kihei. Now there's no river at all because all the industry has basically silted up the river and the shoreline is almost parallel and the walls are almost eroded away. So that's pretty much, you are unable to restore that since there's large urban habitat around there. I looked at site comparisons. I just picked three just to show you some examples. This is again the Ko'iye Lukia. 
This one's located in Kia Maui. Again, it has a partially restored wall. Again, it's in a highly urban area, so you have these huge 30-story uh, condominium complexes that are right next door within 30 feet of the pond. And there's a huge um, load from sewage outfall right in that area. So again, it's good for education purposes, but you would, probably would never be able to restore that one. We have the Waikalua Lokuia, which is more on a residential area, so there's not as much of an effect, but there's a high sediment load, so you have this huge issue with removing sedimentation. And then you have more of the pristine one here, which is on the Ulapua Lokuia, which is located on Maui. And this one has a, a really predominant wall. You can sort of see that. And very, very little sedimentation. And this is where more local natives live, um, so local Hawaiians. And some of them still actually use it for different types of fish and so forth. And then, of course, I wanted to look at the demographics. I don't know if any of you have been to Hawaii, but if you go there, you're not, usually you're not going to succeed in any kind of project if you don't include the local people, because they'll, they'll stop you. <laughs> and uh, so I wanted to look at demographics. I wanted to look at, of course, you know, the road stands where they sell these, the markets that they sell these fishing, if they are able to use these ponds again, or the population, if it's highly urban or local. Education, of course, is a huge factor there, and employment. And uh, so, I mean, they still have you know, small little markets there on sides of the roads and still drive little cars that sell these fish. I mean, most of you probably been to Honolulu, but there's a lot of parts of the other islands that are nothing near Honolulu, though. And then you all of a sudden look at Honolulu here, which is highly urban, and it's again, it's Pearl Harbor. So the project aims for my objectives will be, of course, looking at the effect of present-day marine aquaculture on the coastal benthic communities, as well as the environmental impact of native Hawaiian aupua system. And hopefully I can obtain that um, doing two things, looking at water quality issues, as well as uh, sedimentation, looking at the transition in sediment over years. Um, and actually, after, talk, after listening to Jessica's talk, I've even considered looking at corals now, but we'll see. I'll talk to her more about that. <laughs> my third project, this is where I get into the interdisciplinary, that's a huge interdisciplinary part of my project. And it's looking at advancement in physics technology throughout Polynesia. Um, what we plan to do is looking at basaltic cores of these ponds. So we're taking basically cores of these basaltic rocks um, dating the crustal coralin that has settled on them when they were placed in the water and finding out when they were created. So hopefully we can look at the radiation of fishing technology through the Polynesian islands and see if they follow the migration of humans to those islands. And uh, right now we have sites in Hawaii, Morea, Rorotonga, and I'd like to include Nihui, Tonga, Samoa, and Tuvalu, which gives me the whole uh, Polynesian curve coming up to Hawaii. I uh, looked at site suitability of Hawaiian fish ponds, and right, I just took a GIS course and I'm trying to learn more, and, and what we plan to do is if I know the factors um, around these ponds, so this graph shows these little circles are fish ponds, and the black lines, if you can see them, are kind of the little the segregations of, of the uh, Hawaiian integrated farming systems. If I know the factors of where they put these ponds, so they put them in a certain area because the uh, currents were, were there, or they put them in certain areas because the topography was white, or the watershed was white. So if I find these factors and I put them in a GIS, I can find out you know, which ponds and what kind of species they were using there and why they were, why they were built there what factors allowed them to build it there. And hopefully with GIS, I can kind of tease at that and find out why they're doing that, why they, why they did that, actually. And then, of course, here's where the MBA, I'm not just getting it for fun, but I'm actually going to use it for the project, um, is looking at an economic contingent valuation survey. And hopefully what I can do is, if you think about aquaculture in general, I know we're trying to restore this and help the environment, but it is a business. I mean, you are trying to sell a product. And, and hopefully if you can sell it to someone, you can use it for local economy, you can lose your local subsidence and use it for global implementation. And if I can get this contingent valuation survey out there, I can see if there's support for it, if the local community is able to support it, if other you know, international parties are able to support this, then we go, you know, we can move on and continue on and see if it's possible to actually learn from these techniques and improvise on the um, aquaculture, aquaculture uses and uh, techniques that we use currently. So the significance. So besides the sustainability, as many of you are aware, aware that the fisheries are being overfished out in the ocean, so aquaculture is becoming a new and I guess, um, high thing, uh, but even though there's a lot of aquaculture occurring nowadays, a lot of it's uh, still very, I guess you could use the word, not really eco-friendly because they still have a negative footprint on the environment, and hopefully we can learn from our mistakes and, imp and improve on those techniques as well, um, and that's where the eco-friendly, and then of course, implement it globally to more third world countries and even first world countries. Um, looking at the history of pre and post Western contact Hawaii, and not only Hawaii in general, Polynesia. And I'd just like to point out, I don't know if you guys were familiar with uh, Queen Liliokalani, but uh, that was actually in my family very close to me because it was my grandmother's great aunt. Um, so I have a lineage there. And then of course the Hawaiian culture, the Polynesian culture in general, um, since not only Hawaiians would like to learn it, but non-Hawaiians as well. I'd like to thank, of course, my committee, 
Dr. Jim Liker, who I'm working with, Nancy Nolton, Phil Hastings, and of course, Paul Dayton. Uh, the Iger, who has funded me for the last two years. And I'd really like to thank Eloise and Russ Duff, who has given me support for this project. Uh, the Fairchilds also. And I didn't have an on here, but also um, George Voico, who has also given me money for travel. And then, of course, all the Hawaiian institutions and students and faculty and my family here at SIO. And I'd like to end up with the small saying. I don't know if anybody wants to raise their hand and try to say this. <laughs> no? OK. <laughs> it's la vieja ma'ele aku ono ono which basically means if you want to learn something, it has to become a part of you. And because this project is so near and dear to me, because it's where my family has come from, it's uh, very much a part of me. And uh, hopefully that can instill me to keep going and learn from what I so far have I've gotten from the islands. And I'd like to say mahalo and any questions. It's, uh, no one really knows. It, there was an article that just recently came out in Science where they dated different types of shrines, and they estimated it around between 25 and 3,000 years ago, the Hawaiian Islands. And they came through the French Polynesia, the Society Islands. Um, but that's, again, dating these shrines. But it's still kind of in ambigu ambiguity. Nobody really knows exactly where Hawaiians came from. Oh, uh, sorry, I need to repeat the questions. Um, he said, are there evidence of other fish ponds in other parts of Polynesia? Uh, no, there's not. Hawaii is the only one that has the enclosed fish pond, the local kuapa, where they're able to harvest and raise the fish. There are fish traps, the local umeke that I mentioned, throughout all the society islands, and that's why I'm trying to look at the radiation of this technology, because it's believed that the fish traps were the predecessors to the ponds. So if I can see and date these, I can see if they radiated with the migration. Okay, um, he mentioned, how, I, how do I uh, plan on dating these to find out how old the actual rocks are? Well, when the rocks were put in the, the water, what I've noticed and what I've, I've read through different types of uh, documentation and previous studies is that uh, once you place them in the water, different types of crustal coral and algae settled onto them, and you can date coral and algae, so you either using uranium, thorium, or carbon-14. And if you can date the coral and algae, you can date when they settle on the rocks. You can basically date when the rocks were put in the water and when the wall was built. So you can kind of use it as a reference to see when these ponds were built. The only part right now is, of course, the survey to find out if there's support for it. I would, of course, like to, if, if I go into postdoc, where include education. I think education is, is a key to, to keeping these ponds successful. You're going to have to teach them. And again, like I mentioned earlier, some of these ponds are in areas that you're not able to restore, but they're good teaching tools. And uh, so I would like to incorporate the economics in all aspects of the, uh, of the, of the ponds, not just aquaculture, not just selling uh, product. Uh, he mentioned, uh, besides using these facilities just for selling a product, is there any other type of um, economy can be used for, and I mentioned, uh, yes, it can be used for also education and uh, various other types of outreach and uh, just learning. She asked if there's any financial help from the Hawaiian state government. Uh, unfortunately, right now there's not, and the only reason that's the case is because I'm based in California, and it makes it hard for them to fund me for Hawaii. Even though I'm native Hawaiian, I don't live there anymore, and so they have a kind of a, a, a gripe about that, and they want me to actually be stationed there. Go, uh, go figure. I don't know why it's the case. I mean. <laughs> but that's, that, that, is, that is the case. But there is a bill going through Congress right now trying to classify Native Hawaiians as Native Americans so they can get additional funding for other things. But it's not there yet. So uh, let's thank Damien. Sure.